which property of the dopamine makes the dopamine a ideal agent in the management of congestive heart failure you know very well beta 1 agonistic agents increase the contractility of the heart and inotropic state which is good in congestive heart failure d receptor agonism will increase the blood flow to the kidney and it prevents the acute tubular necrosis that's the reason it is also useful but alpha 1 agonistic activity is vasoconstrictive in nature generally we don't use dopamine for its alpha 1 agonistic action but we use it for its beta 1 d receptor and vasomotor action is what need to be remembered so at the medium infusion rates beta 1 receptors are stimulated and uh, at the low infusion rate which is defined as 0.22 to 2 micrograms per kg per minute being a house surgeon how to put a dopamine drip mannitol drip noradrenaline drip nitroprusside drip five six infusions you should be hands on by the end of the housemanship i hope so which glaucoma drug lead to development of black spots can the online students can punch whether the voice is loud and clear <coughs> the black spots in conjunctiva are because of epinephrine generally one question is asked on the glaucoma drugs which will decrease the aqueous production which will increase the drainage across the canal of schlem you must be very very sure about so these are the typical corneal and conjunctival black spots which are typically seen in the people who are taking a topical epinephrine and uh, the derivatives of it of all proton pump inhibitors which has got the lowest affinity towards the cyp receptor p450 uh system is there right so if you take lansoprazole omeprazole pantoprazole they are all metabolized by p450 especially cyp 2c19 and cyp 3a4 are the ones which are associated now if you take these three lansoprazole omeprazole pantoprazole pantoprazole has the least affinity but if you also consider rabiprazole among the other options then rabiprazole has the lowest affinity then second lowest is pantoprazole that is how you need to basically remember what is that arb which has got a ppar gamma activity why do you want arb with a ppar activity is a very important question <clears throat> lot of times where do we give arb arb that is angiotensin receptor blocker is the one which we give to treat the hypertension a very common cause of the hypertension is underlying diabetes so that is the reason if arb also has got a ppa or gamma activity you know very well lot of diabetic drugs especially glitazones they all have got ppar gamma activity so a arb with ppar gamma activity will have a better scoring and one up man she poor that of the other arbs is what you need to appreciate tell me certain it's a routine practice once upon a time losartan used to be a routine practice losar h losar h probably 10000 prescriptions we would have written 10000 what at least 50000 prescriptions we would have written on losar h losar h then tell me certain has taken over because of certain few more extra points that it scores over that of the other arbs one question invariably is asked about uh, <coughs> dp is saying voice is not clear can you <coughs> uh is a voice clear for others can you please punch yeah what is not gp2b3a inhibitor one question on antiplatelets 
aspirin, clopidogrel and the various GP2B3A receptors. What are the direct thrombin and indirect thrombin inhibitors among the antithrombotic agents? These are all the favorite questions of the examiner. Without this, there is no question paper. So, that is the reason, doctor. Tirofiban, Apsixibab, Iptafibitide are the ones which are uh, basically called GP2B3A. What is Prasugril? We will come to Prasugril. But this is very important table, doctor. Once more, you are going to take the Jipmer exam next Sunday. After the Jipmer exam is over, once more on Tuesday or Wednesday, we will have a discussion of the Jipmer paper. <coughs> Definitely one question comes on antiplatelet agents. Those who did not pick up the high yield topic list among you, please collect the high yield topic list. What are the 600 topics from which 85% of the question paper comes? Every entrance exam you go. We have clearly delineated 650 topics in 19 subjects. Please ask for your copy of the topics. <coughs> So, whether renal dysfunction, do you need to require a dose adjustment to the differentiator? Many times this question was asked about GP2B3A inhibitors. Apsiximab does not require any dose adjustment in renal failure. Please don't forget. Once more, Jipmer, they will ask the same question and you will remember me in the exam hall. <coughs> so, Thrombocytopenia as a side effect is the most common side effect in Apsixibab compared to that of the others. So, this table very very high yielding. So, now what is Prosugril is the question. Prosugril is the one which will inhibit the platelet aggregation by acting as an inhibitor of the ADP receptor. ADP, ADP are there no? ADP is one of the important stimulant to enable one platelet to bind with another to form a clot. So, Prasugril is a class of ADP receptor inhibitors, not GP2B3A inhibitor is what you need to remember. Once more, Bernard Solier, Glangemann's thrombosthenia and uh, Von Willebrand. Definitely one question they will ask. So, if you go to anatomy2medicine.com, you have got the four question banks. Ames, last 15 years, 6500 questions, totally 30 question papers, topic wise, subject wise, topic wise discussed. 150 hours video will be there. Similarly, PGI, Jipmer, DNB. These four question banks, 25,000 questions, 600 hours discussion, doctor. 150 into 4. Everything in the world is there in that. If you are still not happy, you have got hundreds of hours of theory on every topic available as a video library in anatomy2medicine.com. So, whatever it is, black or white, catch the mouse is the story. So, ultimately getting seat in this cutthroat competition how many percentage of people have got the seats available after you take entrance? If 100 people wrote, how many have got seats available in PG? Yes. Come on. General knowledge doctor. <coughs> 1.2 lakh P applicants are there pan India. Only 12,000 MD seats are there. Maybe another 10-15 thousand are uh, DNB. But still 90,000 remain without uh, a seat. And uh, every year once more 54,000 new students are released. Life is miserable. But the point is there is a way for that. Smartly prepare the 600 topics. Revise these four question banks. And uh, spend not more than 5 600 hours of your time with us. More than enough to get seat and take mock tests on Saturday, Sunday. Subject test on Saturday with discussion and Sunday mock test, which has got image based questions, and uh, uh, automatically you will do the miracles of winning the exam. 
Where do we use the last paraginase? Is a very important question. ALL. Typically, ALL, AML. Which is that AML which has the best prognosis of all AML varieties? APML. Acute promyelocytic leukemia. Because if you give all trans retinoic acid, there is a tremendous response. But at the same time, which ALL has got highest mortality? Once more APML. Because APML will lead to DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation which will kill the patient. That is what you need to basically remember. Tornikey test. Very simple. You tie the tornikey and look for the petechiae. And a typical positive test, more than 20 petechiae per square inch. Is a typical feature in the case of uh, dengue fever, as all of you know very well. <clears throat> 70 year old with everted marginated ulcer on the cheek. Which one? Classically, rodent ulcer is the name given for the basal cell carcinoma, and it has got a nodular, superficial spreading, etc. etc. But uh, if it is the lower cheek, what is the most common tumor? Not basal. Squamous actually. But uh, the point is that of um, rolling edges is a clue to say that heaping edges, rolling edges, etc. Eh, is uh, the clue towards basal. Nocturnal enuresis is there in a 6 year old. These are all recall questions doctor. Recall means you know that uh, our students will forget sometimes the main point what examiner want and uh, uh, give me <coughs> after all I am uh, I don't write uh, entrance every time I only deliver a uh, explanation on what you give me so exact questions may be different so don't be angry upon me Are I said some, something else is given and something else you are pre presenting here yeah could be uh, difference 6 year old Habit of bedwetting with no abnormal findings when you have done the urinary investigations. What do you want to do? <coughs> what is your answer? Reassurance and follow up. What is the age group? To define nocturnal enuresis, 5. But to treat nocturnal enuresis, there is also a benchmark according to recommendations. To treat 7 years. So less than 7 years reassurance and follow up. <coughs> Above 7 years you will do alarm therapy. Alarm therapy. Night time you will make the baby to get up and uh, go to the washroom is what need to be remembered. <coughs> Yeah. So that is very important. So 7 years is the benchmark. So if the child is more than 7 years or if there is any significant psychosocial disturbance, for the parent it will be a distressing experience. <coughs> Especially if the parent is a doctor. If you are a doctor then we will be thinking, is my child is having a conflict in his embryonic life because when he was in his fetal life that time I was preparing for PG entrance poor guy had a stress in those days and now this nocturnal enuresis has come because of that so unnecessary guilt as a, a doctor to be a parent is very challenging if the child has fever we will be thinking of meningitis and deafness due to hemophilus influenza we will be doubly Double times checking whether we vaccinated the child or not. Yeah, life is uh, very challenging. <coughs> so, 7 years is the benchmark. I leave the literature for you. Questions are given to you and uh, leave your email ID. We will post you the PDF of this. <coughs> or you can download it from our uh, news portal called newsformedico.com. Alarm therapy. Now, 
radical mastectomy was done and uh, subcuticular sutures are uh, to be put which suture material do you want to prefer different uh, suture material images had been given in the exam so let us look into what is the theory behind it fundamentally what type of sutures do you have absorbable non absorbable biological and synthetic this is the most important classification definitely sutures is a high yield topic in the 60 topics in surgery given to you in the topic list booklet sutures is one of the very high yield topic vicryl monocryl coated vicryl and uh, pds2 they are all synthetic absorbable mercilk suture is a biological non absorbable and mercilin proline ethylene they are all synthetic non absorbable now for different purposes different suture material like different parties different suit and uh, shoe for blood vessels we use proline for the fascia it is ethylene proline and pds2 for the subcuticular we use coated vicryl pds2 and proline so that is what uh, we need to basically remember this uh, table is worth uh, reviewing similarly suture needles also what is the next aims november question you will be given different types of needles and ask do you know stitching or not yeah so round body taper point reverse cutting trucker point different types will be there go through google images you will find each type how it looks like at least visual aura be sure about it then once more suturing techniques will be there per string etc and uh, in both scenarios do you want to do this different suture techniques what is advantage of one over the above is another very common question so life is sutured so be sure uh, to suture it well a major surgery is being done we'll come back to this question <clears throat> yeah there is a pediatric case given with hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia obviously that is glycogen storage and you must be quite sure with all the list of glycogen storage and uh, which glycogen storage disorders lead to cirrhosis of liver which will lead to muscle involvement which presents as hypoglycemia all these things you must be sure if you take one guy there will be severe hypoglycemia hepatic adenomas and uh, it can even lead to renal failure is what need to be remembered and cirrhosis of liver is a thing that you see with anderson which is because of the branching enzyme deficiency is what i want to underscore to all of you <clears throat> now a child has pneumonia has ards and a chest x-ray x-ray was given so in the chest x-ray there were a drainage tube which was there and uh, mediastinal shift was there effusion was there there was no pneumothorax that's what uh, most of the students who took the exam were sure about i don't know what exactly was the frame of the question you can let me know after the session now this is how sometimes whenever the patient has got uh, a significant pneumonia with ards with effusion you may need to put a, a pigtail catheter and need to drain out the fluid especially if it is causing a mediastinal shift is what you need to appreciate a winging of the scapula was given in a 5 year old child who has got a pain on neck movement and the right shoulder movement the point is long thoracic nerve injury like this can lead to winging of scapula but it should not cause a pain on neck movement because there is no fixation of the vertebrae in the neck so a condition where there is a winging of scapula with a low hairline with the limitation of the movement of the neck is typically a sprengel deformity and klippelfeld syndrome possibly that could be the idea behind examiner asking the question then facio scapulo humeral dystrophy how will you recognize it very simple look at the deltoid 
the deltoid will be relatively hypertrophy and uh, the biceps will be almost like a thread popeye the cartoon figure shape is facio scapulo humeral dystrophy is what need to be remembered so i need a literature for you on uh, what are the key features of all these dystrophies uh, becker duffy in facio scapulo humeral etc etc this is a little out of the box question there was a tibial bent and swelling was there I am not sure which image was given, but I will show you each of these. This is an example of pseudoarthrosis. Congenitally only people may have pseudoarthrosis. This is another example of a congenital pseudoarthrosis before surgery. Then tibial hemimelia. It is not a city in Tibet, but tibial hemimelia is absence of the tibia. Similarly, you will have fibular hemimelia. That is, fibula is absent. Fibular hemimelia. So suddenly, don't uh, start thinking. What are all these hemimelias? At most, fractured neck of femur only is too much a topic for us. Orthopedics in undergraduate means. But I told you, you know, 30-40 questions, completely idiotic questions. It's not in your control. Bhagwan, upar wale ke haath mein hai. Jaha pana. So, remaining questions, yeah. You should answer. Any exam is like that, basically. Your all preparation is for 140 out of 200. And 30 to 35 questions are common sense. You can't, by preparation, you cannot have better common sense. By working in hospital and generally, generally by having common sense, you will have common sense. You are born with it or you are not born with it. Simple. Right? 30 questions is rummy. Online rummy. Nowadays. So, a fracture was given. Montegia or Galeazzi. How will you recognize? Montegia is a fracture of the proximal third of the ulna. With the dislocation of the head of the radius. Galiazi galis hota hai, galis niche hota hai. So that is the reason it is a fracture in the lower end. Is galiazi, upper end is Mount Montegia, is what need to be remembered. A supracondylar fracture image was given, and what is the most common nerve injured? So the only challenge is for you to recognize that there is a supracondylar fracture. But you guys are prepared so much for exam, I know that very well. Nerve injured fracture is there, means only one fracture commonly asked in that area is supracondylar. We are experts in closing eyes and imagining conditions, no? So, uh, this should, examiner must uh, feel uh, completely ashamed that all students answered it correctly kind of a scenarios. These are. So, it is the median. Anterior, interosseous nerve is the most common now, which is involved in supracondylar fracture is what need to be remembered. The most common nerve palsy uh, is anterior nerve neuropraxia. Now, in an electrophoresis, a stepladder kind of an image was being given. Earlier days, they used to ask simply, stepladder pattern is... Uh, the bladder pattern is found where? If apoptosis is among the options, what is the answer? Apoptosis only is the answer. Because one question on apoptosis has to be asked. So, step ladder pattern is a feature on electrophoresis in case of uh, apoptosis. If you have not read about the mitochondrial pathway in apoptosis, what are the Bax gene, bad gene, pro and anti-apototic factors? The two pages of apotosis in Robin's pathology, if you don't read, didn't read and go, Quatran Vinay Kumar will be heaving in the graveyard. Oh, what happened to all my Indian students? Nowadays, nobody is reading Robin's, right? Robin's, Grace. Uh, nowadays, it is... Uh, Short notes of short notes of short notes of Robinson. 
already some fellow in the seniors will read robins he will write a short notes wo bhi padhne ke liye energy nahi hai uska short notes aur koi junior likhta hai finally wo padh ke hamara short notes bana ke uska that become the gold standard for all the future generation of our juniors so that is step ladder pattern now doctor um testicular biopsy was done which is the preservative in which a testicular biopsy is basically stored very standard question one question on preservatives different preservatives in forensic medicine is a favorite question but even pathology also preservatives 10% formaldehyde solution is the place where you put the thing chromogran in positive histopathological slide has been shown and the patient has got cough and weight loss so typically where do you see classically you are having small cell cancers not only lung anywhere chromogranin positivity is one of the important uh, classical feature of all of them one question on hypersensitivity easiest question what is the difference between type 2 and type 3 a free floating antibody against a fixed antigen is cytotoxic injury which is type 2 a free antigen and also free antibody together forms a immune complex and that goes and deposit what do you call type 3 serum sickness and polyarthritis nodosa sle hypersensitive pneumonitis they are all type 3 good posture hemolytic reactions hyperacute graft rejection are all due to preformed antibodies which are against a fixed antigen hence they come under type 2 is what need to be remembered now doctor a flea bitten kidney was given and asked do you know how it looks like when a flea bites you right we are ready with all kinds of fleas anyway in uh, spm heart tick soft tick mite flea uh, all possible uh, arthropoda as an extension of our zoology into medical school we remember no you have to so this is typical in case of uh, um a very significant uncontrolled hypertension when the kidney get involved with arteriosclerosis then there will be minute petechial hemorrhages on the surface of the kidney which is called the flea bitten kidney which is not a antigen presenting cell all of us know macrophage langerhans cell is antigen presenting no tension a bishwe m cell kya hai is m cell is mitral cell is m cell is merkel disc what is m cell right i was also first time knowing it last night only m cell so fundamentally m cells are called microfold cells and they are typically present in the pears patches in the intestine and their follicle associated epithelium their job is our gut is exposed to so many pizzas पानी पूरी सब कुछ खाने के बाद ऑल ऑर्गेनिजम विल गो इन टू गट नो राइट सो दिस यंग सेल्स इन पेयर स्पैच विल पिकअप ऑल दो ऑर्गेनिजम एंड गिव इट टू द एंटीजन प्रेजेंटिंग सेल्स बाई इट सेल्फ इट इज नॉट एन एंटीजन प्रेजेंटिंग सेल बट एस टाइमोसाइट इज एन एंटीजन प्रेजेंटिंग सेल सो दस रीजन एम सेल शुड बी दंसर फॉर दिस how many of you have done abg at least a vbg try to do a arterial blood gas but lot of times venous blood comes out and uh, the nurse mary will uh, tell that doctor how to recognize a venous blood compared to arterial blood i i still remember uh, one of the nurse was telling uh, remember the lipstick color it is the way to recognize whether it is a abg or vbg then a younger nurse was asking if it is a vbg how it looks like it looks like our black cmo cmo skin color is vbg her lipstick color is abg so that is the gold standard in those days so uh, recognizing abg is important we do radial artery why radial artery because it is most superficial 
right? Then um, uh, that is the true statement. If Addison's test is positive, that means collaterals are not there. Then the, you need to go to the other side. Then 0.3 ml heparin is too much of heparin. There are some standards about how much heparin should be taken, aspirated into the syringe. I leave the literature for you. There is hypercalcemia. What is the next step you want to do? Beautiful question. <clears throat> very good. 70 plus online viewers. Very happy to see. So, doctor, whenever hypercalcemia is there, because of the severe abdominal pain and etc. etc. Patient will not be taking fluids. So generally they are in a stage and another thing is hypercalcemia lead to significant of polyuria. Because of that he is in a volume depleted state. The first thing you need to do is to give saline. You need to replenish the saline. If you don't replenish the intravascular volume with normal saline, what will happen? It will perpetuate the hypercalcemia. Why? Suppose if you are dehydrated, what is the natural response of our body? Nephron. It will try to do more and more sodium reabsorption in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. And that will worsen the hypercalcemia. In turn, because that is a cation, this is also a cation. So that is the reason first isotonic volume repletion, then you need to give frusamide. What is the difference between loop diuretics and thyroid diuretics? Loop diuretics lose calcium into urine. Thyroid diuretics retain the calcium into the body. That is the reason whenever an elderly person comes with hypertension, why do you prefer to give thyroid? Thyroid is preferred because Thyroid not only is a diuretic, thyroid also will help the osteoporosis by being a calcium retaining drug. But if an elderly person comes, if you give thyroid, what is the tension about it? What is the problem about it? Thyroid can damage the lipid profile. Lipid profile. That is the reason you need to worry to give thyroid. But overall, thyroid is a preferable one drug whenever a Elderly person, especially if they have an isolated systolic hypertension, whenever they come, thyroid is considered to be the drug of choice. Now, post tubercular bronchiectasis, what is the typical sound on auscultation? Basically, bibacillar crackles are found in very few conditions. One of them is bronchiectasis. So, crackles, are they clearing after the patient coughs? Whenever you listen crackles on auscultation, you should ask patient, please cough. Why do we ask please cough? After the coughing, same area when you auscultate, are they clearing or not clearing? You have to look for. The crackles that do not clear with cough, what is the cause for that? That indicates pulmonary edema or the fluid in the alveoli which can occur whenever there is any congestive heart failure or whenever there is a pulmonary fibrosis or whenever there is an ARDS. In all these scenarios, typically crackles do not clear after the cough. But crackles that partially clear after the coughing, they generally indicate bronchiectasis. Then uh, you have two types of crackles, fine crackles, coarse crackles. So, fine crackles are usually late inspiratory. Coarse crackles are typically early inspiratory. And uh, where do you see fine crackles? They usually indicate presence of an interstitial pathology like CHF or pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, uh, if there are any persistent lung crackles, any persistent pathology should be considered. A persistent pathology in the lung is bronchiectasis. That is what you need to appreciate. Now, a histopathological feature of the myocardium has been shown. And uh, there is a waviness of the fibers. Some of the online students um, 
after this session is over anyway we will put this on youtube the video if you go to youtube.com slash online mbbs on our channel every week whenever a mock test is conducted all the image based question discussions have all been put as a free video there is a paid site called anatomy to medicine.com still we believe knowledge is supposed to be free once upon a time but uh, slowly we have become commercial teachers and uh, uh, people pay some pariharam for the varahalu to be given so uh, uh, so anatomy to medicine.com you have got thousands of videos both theory mcq based discussion everything that we discuss on this floor we will put it there some of them we keep uh, putting voluntarily in youtube so image based questions for the dmd pattern if you type you get all image based questions discussions let me tell you image based questions are very easy to solve just you need to use common sense right no preparation required that's a good thing about it and if you prepare you can't answer that is also there i am telling you there is no voluntary preparation for image based questions right so the first to six hours you find waviness of the myocardial fibers uh, is what you need to remember and looking at that waviness you should recognize it is six hours a lady traveled for 16 hours has developed dvt what is the next step in the management so fundamentally whenever dvt is there the first thing to do is anticoagulation so anticoagulation we do with heparin but heparin can lead to hit heparin induced thrombocytopenia in some people once more hit there is hit to type 1 hit to type 2 reaction so if the hit is a real problem then we use direct thrombin inhibitor agents like like ergotroban etc etc so that is the story of anticoagulation the first step is what need to be remembered why do you do mini mental status examination mmsc typically b b is the answer not c correction b memory so it's a 30 point questionnaire when you do md general medicine final year no md general medicine final year may there will be one neurological case definitely you are supposed to write mmsc score of the patient if you start asking every question of this 30 items your grandfather will be reborn as a reincarnation utna time lagega so what we used to do is we used to write all the 30 points in the mmsc and get ready almost to fill it and go so that uh, you ask the name hey do you know who is the chief minister of this state yeah if he answers then mmsc 30 out of 30 and uh, anyway when examiner comes he will tell sir his short term memory is good long term memory is good and his forward counting is good backward counting is this good and he said that please pass the please pass this candidate so uh, you will be quickly uttering everything huh? so it has got 30 items once you start practicing you will uh, do it very fast orientation registration attention calculation recall and language tests and some uh, drawings patient has to make right so total score is 30 so it is basically for memory and dementia recognition you will be doing ph low pco2 high i think even a newborn baby also if you are carrying uh, and prepared for entrance exam after he is born he will get half of the high yield topics that you studied he will also tell oh ph 7.33 and uh, uh, pc go to 35 and uh, 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 so that is respiratory acidosis so while uh, i used to prepare for md entrance uh, my sister's daughter very brilliant girl she was just in 6th class but uh, she was uh, she used to now she is a vice president in google uh, those days she was uh, in 6th class so uh, she said she used to say uh, mama it's only 
low pH, then you have to look for uh, how is the bicarb, and based on that you will decide whether it is acidosis or alkalosis. Even kids can be able to answer uh, acid based disturbances are such a simple thing to interpret. Let me tell you. So respiratory acidosis. Then uh, a AFib ECG was given. Definitely two ECGs or three ECGs are expected. Very easy. Uh, if you know standard ECGs and uh, 2, 3 AVF is inferior leads, V1, V2 are right sided leads, lead 1, AVL, lead 1, AVL, V5, V6 are lateral leads. If you know that, you know how to recognize an MI. Generally, you don't find a tall R wave in lead V1, you will find tall R wave in only the V6. If you find tall R wave in the lead V1, it indicates positive ball MI. So, all this funda, hundreds of times we discussed and all this is available as a video. ECG in AIMS, what are the questions asked, PGI, what was asked and all exams. Huh? So, review the MCQ video uh, sessions in anatomy to medicine.com. Absence of the P wave before the QRS in the lead 2. Lead 2 is called the rhythm strip. How is lead to? Uh, how do you get lead to? If you connect right arm with the left arm, you get lead one. Right arm with the left leg, you get lead two. Left arm with the left leg, you get lead three. Our cardiac electrical mean QRS is passing. How it is passing? Right to left, about to below. Lead two is also passing. Right to left, about to below. Because lead two you get by joining. Right arm with left leg. That is the reason lead 2 is considered to be the rhythm strip where you need to basically look for the rhythm. Are there any missed beats? Is there any AV dissociation? Is there any absence of P wave? Etc. Etc. So, whenever there is an AF, the challenge is rate control versus rhythm control. So, there is a protocol. How will you basically manage uh, AF, uh, which is beyond the scope of the today's class? So, uh, just review that, doctor. Beautiful question. Alveolo arterial oxygen gradient. Based on that, how will you make a diagnosis of hypoxia? Two minutes of your time, I will take pen. Yeah. Fundamentally, what is alveolo arterial oxygen gradient? You inhale oxygen, it will go and sit in alveolus. So, it, it has some partial pressure. From alveolus, it has to jump into pulmonary capillary and into artery. Right? So, you have a arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Any pathology between alveolus and the capillary like a pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary edema or anything, what will it do? Typically, you have the alveolus, you are having the um, capillary. Capillary. So, the oxygen here has to jump into this. So, this is alveolar, this is arterial, I mean alveolar and this is arterial oxygen partial pressure. Most of the conditions of the hypoxia, what are they due to? They are due to ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. That is the areas where there is a perfusion, there is no ventilation because of atelectasis or wherever there is ventilation, there is no perfusion because of pulmonary embolus. Either way. So, in all these scenarios, alveolo arterial oxygen gradient will increase because alveolus has got oxygen but artery is not having oxygen because of this. V by Q mismatch. Any diffusion defect like fibrosis or pulmonary edema will also lead to development of alveolo arterial oxygen gradient to increase and there is a hypoxia. But if the hypoxia is because of hypoventilation, for example, you have taken barbiturates, you develop respiratory depression, then your alveoli are not receiving air properly, nor the oxygen is going into 
if he is already a beggar where will he donate money right so if there is no oxygen coming at all how will it go into vessel it won't go so there is a hypoxia but a normal alveolar arterial oxygen gradient in all conditions of hypoventilation causing hypoxia now the examiner's question is out of all the various causes of hypoxia where the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient is increased maximum amount of disturbance where will you see increase of the gradient interstitial lung disease is the worst scenario is what you need to basically remember so any right or left interpulmonary shunt or v by q mismatch or alveolar um alveolar hypoventilation is ild but uh, neuromuscular disease leading to diaphragmatic hypoventilation is normal a gradient that's what you need to appreciate in dengue hemorrhagic fever every day you have to measure what not platelets platelets is the depression you will get depression if you measure platelets platelet life itself is 1 1 to 2 days if you artificially infuse platelets also they will die within one day so it's a waste of money unless your brother in law has a blood bank right hematocrit you have to because hematocrit characteristic finding is basically uh, hematocrit increase greater than 20% is a sign of hemo concentration and shock dengue can be a dengue fever or a dengue hemorrhagic shock shock is more ominous you don't want to let the patient go into shock or if he goes into shock you need to manage the shock so that you will do it by checking the hematocrit why there will be a shock in dengue because dengue increase the capillary permeability and all fluid leaks out of it and that typically lead to intravascular dehydration leading to rise of hematocrit acute hemorrhage what do you want to give so fundamentally colloid versus crystalloid the preference between the two is important but if it is a hemorrhagic shock then we tend to use the agents like hydroxy ethyl starch in order to treat uh, um, a colloid is basically given in the urea clearance formula uv by b what is u fundamentally uv by b or whatever you call u is the urinary urea urine may urea in milligram per liter and pu is plasma urea in uh, milligram per ml so that's what examiner want to know it is the urine urea concentration per 100 ml of urine milligram per ml actually um, is what you need to basically remember so what is the normal urea clearance 60 to 95 and what is the normal rate of excretion of urine around 2 minutes 2 ml per minute all of you will be managing uh, amcs and intensive care units most important thing to see in the rounds is what not the top of the bed but below the bed holy catheter mein kitna aaya aur fluid input output chart mein kitna pani andar gaye aur kitna peshab bahar aaye so that is what uh, you must be ready to remember all 20 beds by mind then you are a good clinician what is a good clinician good clinician is not reading harrison if you remember patient's name patient's first wife second wife third wife everybody's name you are super doctor right and if the patient's history if you can remember after a couple of years also you are a great doctor that will only happen if you have the commitments to the commitment towards the patient knowledge is last thing doctor let me tell you knowledge is last thing you will be highly knowledgeable if you are not committed you won't take an action what patient is looking for you is an actionable in emergency medicine right so that's very important where do we use nimodipine subarachnoid hemorrhage what is the main part of management of subarachnoid hemorrhage we to prevent vasospasm we give calcium channel blocker like nimodipine nicely hydrate the patient fluid fluids fluids you give as many fluids because any amount of slight dehydration will lead to vasospasm and lead to ischemia to the brain subarachnoid hemorrhage is 
above the brain there is a paya paya ke upar arachinoid between arachinoid and the paya bleed is there not between paya and brain it is not intracerebral so that is the reason when the bleed is above the paya it is not supposed to cause hypoxia to the brain it is not intracerebral bleed there is a reason you don't get hemiplegia like focal neurological deficits in a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient when will the patient of subarachnoid hemorrhage get a focal neurological deficit if the vessel passing through the subarachnoid space into the brain surrounded by that subarachnoid bleed if it irritates it it will go into spasm more so if the patient is dehydrated so avoiding dehydration by nicely hydrating the patient is the first thing second is giving nimodipine is what you need to remember a young female with fever hypertension for 3 days with erythrogenic rash was given and you are asked to recognize that it is a meningococcus cheapest question on the planet right very easy waterhouse fredrickson syndrome 